so here we go. Um, yeah, welcome to the Greenwashing and uh, False Solutions webinar. Um, we have quite a few sort of exciting speakers on this this evening. Um, I think greenwashing is obviously a very important issue at the moment. It's come come to the fore as as we've had a, something of a revolution around uh, zero carbon and net zero targets, um, and airlines have realised that uh, that they need to decarbonise or at least talk about it um, in order to to maintain their their social licence and maintain their their sort of acceptability. And the bailouts have made that more clear when a lot of bailouts have ended up being Sort of tied uh, tied to or, or framed around uh, achieving net zero targets or achieving carbon reductions in some way or another. Um, the issues obviously around greenwashing are, are really are complex in some cases and they're really varied. So to, this evening we're going to try and go through the sort of the as full a set as we can in in an hour in sort of almost yeah, two hours. Um, so we're going to have. Um, just quickly to, to summarize what the plan is in terms of the agenda we're going to have five presentations um a more sort of one we'll start with finley talking about technologies um we'll have got ali then talking about uh, greenwashing and uh, negative emissions and the airlines and airports uh Almuth will talk to us about biofuels um uh, Gary's going to look more at Corsia and some technical bits with offsetting, and Simone has a more practical view on on sort of the impacts that these solutions have on people. Um, and then we're going to get more interactive. But in between those talks, uh, we we do we want to have your questions sort of on that specific talk. So really focus questions on on the on sort of the presentation you've just seen. It's really welcome. Um, so let's just just to go go through uh, who the people who's going to be speaking this evening. Um, Finley, starting with you, where whereabouts are you, and what's your your background? I'm Finley. I'm in Scotland. My background is aerospace engineering and designing aircraft engines. So that's what I'll be I'll be talking about the technology around aircraft and aircraft engines. Great, um, Ali. Hi everybody, um, I'm Ali, I'm from Possible, which is a uh, climate charity in London and my background is campaigning and climate activism and yeah I've also had a bit of a long-standing int uh, interest in greenwashing by fossil fuel companies so this fits in with that quite well. Great, thanks. Um, Alma? Yes, I'm Alma, I work with Biofuel Watch, I'm also based in Scotland in Edinburgh and uh, I'm going to speak about aviation biofuels. Uh, Gary? Hello, and it's really fun to be here joining everyone. My name is Gary Hughes. I too work with Biofuel Watch as the California Policy Monitor. So I'm joining everyone from the San Francisco Bay Area, California today. Great, fantastic. Um, and Simone? Hi, everybody. Nice to see so many people here. Uh, I'm Simone Lovia. I'm the director of the Global Forest Coalition, which is an international coalition of 112 indigenous peoples, women, and uh, groups, and NGOs from 68 different countries. And I'm based myself in Asuncion, Paraguay. Great. Um, fantastic. Well, let's, yeah, let's kick on with um, Finley with your, your presentation. Just unmute myself. Um, let me know if you can see this. Minimize myself. Is that good? Yeah. Cool. Great. So, um, as I said, I'm I'm an, an ex aerospace engineer. So I I quit my job a few months ago, back in August. Um, but until then, I've spent the last seven years working at Rolls Royce. Um, designing particularly future engine concepts. So I'm going to go through and start off by going through some of the technology fixes that are commonly proposed by the industry and sort of break those down, tell you about why they're misleading and why they aren't going to work in themselves without um, effective regulation um, to help us fly less. Okay. So I was asked to just give a bit of background about myself. Um, I say, been designing aircraft engines. This isn't 
this is a presentation I was giving to some school kids. Um, but yeah, as I say, I've been working on future engine concepts at Rolls Royce. So something next step change in aircraft engine design, they're calling it the ultra fan. It's a geared turbo fan. I spent a couple of years helping to architect this at system level um, and look at putting that engine on the latest aircraft that Airbus are producing. I've also worked in future programs looking further into the future, so the kind of 2030s. Um, the next step change in top technology, quite likely to be something, variable, a variable pitch fan. So this is fan blades that um, can rotate and change angle, um, and that can optimize your fuel burn at takeoff and cruise and various things as well. Really complicated. Um, and basically, you know, I'd, just a, a bit about me is re really, I was really interested in environmentalism and I studied engineering because I wanted to make a difference in the world and work on cleaner energy. And when I went to Rolls-Royce, I knew that the aviation industry was very polluting, but I thought if I can go in and I can work on the most future technology um, that's going to reduce fuel burn by a significant amount, then I can have a big impact in that sector because it, we, mean we, can, we can clean up aviation is what I thought. But I'm going to go through how I kind of came to understand that wasn't the case, basically. So just to give you an idea of this is just an example, but a new engine development timeline. And I'd say it takes about 15 years from first conceiving an engine to actually just going in service, the very first engine with the first customer. So it takes about two and a half years to do all the design studies, maybe even more than that. That's kind of the shortest. You then need to do a series of rig tests, testing the individual components. You then go and do a demonstrator engine test, which I've put as five years. And that's usually a couple of years of doing it on the ground and then maybe a flying test bed. And then you've got five more years of doing all the certification testing, building lots of the engines and putting them through bird strike test, ice ingestion, water ingestion, fan blade off, all of these things. It takes about five years as well before entry into service. So you're talking 15 years. So when it comes to the climate crisis, which as I've put here is a this decade issue, you know, if we, we want to have something that's going to help us uh, get anywhere near to reaching our 2050 targets, um, and obviously really needs things ahead of that. So, so well, we need to be developing this stuff now. We need to be designing it now. Um, and there really wasn't much action in the company looking at these concepts. Um, so why, why was that? If, the, the climate, climate crisis is about to happen. We need to stop burning fossil fuels. How come we aren't developing some of these advanced concepts? So the real, if you look at engine designs and what would give us the most efficiency, the biggest step change in technology, something called open rotor, get rid of the nacelle that goes around the engine and have a really high bypass ratio. And you have the propeller blades, the fan blades sticking out into the flow. Um, and this is a, a concept aircraft that Safran have produced. It looks like this. And this is a sort of image from Rolls-Royce, a concept of that. It looks futuristic, but turns out actually a similar concept was produced by GE and flown on a Boeing flight test engine aircraft, sorry, back in the late 1980s. Um, and so, yeah, I, I kind of realized, well, really struggling to get any, any of these projects started. But we've actually worked on this technology 40 years ago. It's not that we don't have the technological understanding, just we obviously don't have the desire. So what happened with this concept? Well, what happened was in the 80s, the oil price was really high. Uh, there was the OPEC oil crisis. And when that ended, the price of oil fell, and all these technology projects, all the wind turbine development, all the really efficient aircraft engine projects, a lot of them got scrapped in the 90s. Um, so it's all, it, you start to realize, so there's less about technology and more about what's the price of oil? How expensive is it to burn oil? Um, right, so why did I leave Rolls-Royce? Well, in 2019, start of 2019, you remember Extinction Rebellion started protesting. Um, the public, the media, they were talking about climate change more and more. 
And this caused um, the aviation industry to get together at the Paris Air Show in mid-2019. And they produced this sustainability strategy. They announced to the world, they were all working together. So you've got the chief technology officers here from Airbus, Boeing, Dassault, GE, Rolls-Royce, my company, Safran, and United Technology Company, American, British, French, German. Um, and they all, they all said, this is a unified commitment we're all making to make aviation more sustainable. This is how we're gonna do it. And I read it and I just thought, this is, this is greenwash as, as we're gonna discuss. Um, and I sort of spent since then a lot of time and effort within the company, challenging the leadership on this strategy um, and poking holes in it. And trying to say that, you know, we, we need to be honest with ourselves and with the public about what's actually required. So the first thing, if you look at this strategy, the first thing that the aviation industry loves to mention is that it only produces two to 3% of global CO2 emissions. So that's true, but you, you've got to put that in the context of that's more emissions than Germany, the UK, Brazil, Mexico, still a lot of emissions, 3%. But the real big issue is because, bigger than these countries, when you project forward to 2050, because all of the other sectors like ground transport, energy generation, that's all decarbonizing, and aviation doesn't have the same decarbonization strategy, it's just planning to keep on growing, it could end up being more like 25% of global CO2 emissions in the next few decades, which is obviously a massive share. The next important thing, as we're going to look at in a separate workshop, is there's non-CO2 impacts, such as nitrogen dioxide, water vapour, soot, contrail formation, and those contribute such that flying is currently warming the planet at approximately three times the rate that's associated with just the CO2 emissions alone. So really you need to sort of triple that CO2 impact um, to get the full total impact of aviation. So right now today, it's not really 3%, it's more like five to 8%. And by 2050, it will be more than just 25%. So that's the first thing we need to get across is aviation is already a big problem and it's only gonna get bigger. So, how does the industry justify this growth? Well, they've got something that I'm going to call the sustainability playbook. It's their list of messages that they use in all of the marketing and all of the media stories um, to get people to buy into, yeah, the aviation industry can continue to grow. We can fly more and more. It's fine. We've got it in hand and it's, it's these solutions. So there's kind of four pillars to this strategy. The first one is um, efficiency improvements. So we make our aircraft and engines more efficient every year. The next is electric flight, um, powering aircraft with batteries. Then there's sustainable aviation fuels, biofuels, which someone else will talk about, and hydrogen, particularly liquid hydrogen. Um, and then finally, carbon offsetting, which we're also going to talk about in this presentation. Another couple um, of minutes. Isn't it? Okay. Um, so, I've already, where am I of time? Okay, I've only got a few minutes. So yeah, efe yeah. efficiency improvements. I'm just gonna show you this graph. In general, we, we'd say that um, since the dawn of the jet age, aircraft is about 80% more efficient than it was 50 years ago. The reality of that is due to the rebound effect. Emissions have been increasing exponentially every year. And projecting forwards, they're going to just continue on the same trajectory, even considering those efficiency improvements. Um, so, the, so what happens is we increase demand, there's a bit of efficiency gain, but still the, the emissions increase every year. And really we need to limit demand so that those efficiency improvements can help reduce emissions rather than continue to fuel the increase. Okay, I'll go quickly through the electric flight and hydrogen. Um, but the real problem with electric flight is the energy density of batteries. So you've got about 43 times the amount of energy in jet fuel than you do in batteries. And also you don't lose the massive batteries during a flight. 
whereas with jet fuel, you burn it off as you go. So that gives you an improvement as well. So really, batteries are only a solution for very, very short trips and very, very small aircraft, even for the next couple of decades. Um, yeah. So hydrogen flight, finally. Um, there's a lot of talk about this from Airbus recently. Um, hydrogen looks a, a lot better than batteries um, on a weight basis. So if you've got one kilogram of hydrogen jet fuel and batteries, you've got 120 megajoules of energy in hydrogen, 44 in jet fuel, and only one in batteries. So hydrogen looks great on a mass basis. The problem is volume. So one liter of hydrogen has eight megajoules, whereas one liter of jet fuel has 32, so it's a quarter. So if you want the same amount of energy in that you have from conventional jet fuel, you need four times the volume of liquid hydrogen. Um, so if you've got the same amount of energy needs four times the volume, you can do two things. You can either increase the aircraft size um, by putting, you know, make, making the aircraft volume bigger and putting the tanks in there, but that makes the aircraft heavier and bigger so there's more drag and it becomes less efficient. Or you can keep the aircraft the same size, but you're gonna get, need to get rid of loads of seats um, to fit in the tanks within that same fuselage. So you've got less um, number of passengers ultimately, and they're all gonna to have to pay more for the ticket price because you're splitting it between fewer number of paying passengers. So the thing about hydrogen is, yes, it is possible, um, but it's gonna make flying a lot more expensive. And yeah, I've got some data on that, but let's not get into that. Okay, so that's me. Oh, great, fantastic. Um, thank you so much. That's uh, There's a lot of uh detailed yeah sort of yeah and sort of yeah science knowledge in there um bit of engineering background i'm afraid so <laughs> go into the detail too much um does anyone have any um any direct questions to, to sort of on that on that presentation um i think Sally? tahir has a question oh, yeah. do you want to unmute and, and bowman's put your video on if you if you like yeah Great. I think, um, yeah, I think the screen share is still on actually, but um, that's that's fine. Yep. Um, if you can hear me okay, I'd um, yep. say, well, thank you, Finley. I mean, that's a really interesting um, presentation. I really appreciate it. I'm a little bit dark there, but hey. Um, <laughs> I, I, two points really. I mean, basically, what you the points the things that you said really reinforced some experiences that I've had recently. And I mean, f firstly, more generally, um, in terms of the business about the price of oil, I think that is that is really interesting about what's the real driver behind any kind of um, uh, move towards more dare I say it sustainable aviation. Um, I know from my own experience in Nats that um, designing shorter routings really gets some uh, very uh, eager participation from the airlines. But of course, that's because shorter routes means less fuel burned. Uh, if you de then suggest, well, actually, uh, what about having less flights? They'd soon be very, uh, take a very different approach to that. Um, but um, the real point I was going to ask, and it's a bit of a nebulous question. I'm just interested in your thoughts on it, really. Um, about about a month ago, I was um, invited to a meeting by Transport and Environment, which is, a, I, th I think, is a kind of EU-related yep. NGO of some sort. Uh, and there were a lot of people uh, at that meeting, much like yourself, who were kind of engineers, designers, architects, and th things like that, presenting on some of the initiatives in terms of uh, uh, better engines, better aircraft types, fuel types, and things like that. And what I found was, and I thought was really interesting, was that they were very genuine about wanting to do something, as, as, as you yourself undoubtedly are, to do something about um, the environmental impact of aviation. Uh, and I thought from the, the kinds of ideas that they were putting forward and their, their re real desire to make a positive difference, uh, it really brought home to me that the greenwashing aspect actually comes from somewhere else. And maybe... Uh, some of these people who are doing these things kind of get bad press sometimes because, you know, you kind of say, well, they work for corporations, therefore they're just trying to pull the wool over our eyes, this kind of thing. But actually, they're trying to do good things, but it's actually the, the, the directors and people above them that then turn that into some kind of, you know, positive advertising for aviation, the kind of messages that you, um, that you uh, 
you portrayed. Yeah, yeah um, so I'd, I'd agree. Yeah, that, um, I, I think the question simplify is like, I, I do think a lot of people are, with, are have an interest in sustainability and moving, like the decarbonization is something that's really of interest, particularly to younger engineers and scientists. But I would say they are often misled by their own leaders in terms of what's actually required and the regulations that need to go alongside the technology. It's very easy to think technology will solve things. Um, and the, the companies and politicians have done a really good job of convincing people that technology will solve things. So the, the key is to um, cut through the misinformation and, and make people aware that it, we, nothing's going to work without regulations. I think the point I'm getting at, Callum, is that um, for, for people like ourselves, there, there is a need to build links, as, as we're doing with Finley himself, with, to build links with these people, even underneath the, um, the kind of the overarching view of the corporations themselves. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, and uh, this, it's been great to see the, the progress that's been, that has been sort of, go, yeah, I think things like Destination 1.5, which, um, you guys are involved with you and, and Todd as well is here. Um, it's, it's a yeah fantastic kind of pro progressive step actually in terms of that engagement. Um, are there the next question is from Ton. Yeah, Ton. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, great uh, presentation, Finley. It's very interesting, and I think it's really important that uh, this type of uh, uh, inside information gets out. Uh, uh, and on a much wider uh, scale. So I'm going to challenge you to um, make a very nice presentation and uh, send it round to all the world. I'll help you with it. Uh, and uh, secondly, my two questions, um, how much do you think that uh, slower flight could help? I mean, obviously, when you push very hard and it costs a lot, of, a lot of energy. And the second part of the question is about um, the use of hydrogen and e-fuel. If you use hydrogen, if you, you, you have to make it from somewhere. You, can, you cannot find it in, in nature. You have to make it from electricity. Uh, so only if you make it from green electricity, it's carbon neutral. Uh, but then uh, there is a, a, a lot of... Um, loss in uh, the um, change from electricity into hydrogen and you, yeah. when you are making e-fuels there is even more loss yeah so couldn't we better use the electricity in uh, like industry or heating houses rather than yeah. in airplanes and just leave them on kerosene yeah uh, yeah i'm aware we've not got much time Callum, so i'll answer quickly um Firstly, thank you. I'm putting a YouTube series together, so I'll send out those links and I'll get Stay Grounded to share them. Um, secondly, flying slower, it's the quickest way to save fuel, and we should be. It's not gonna solve things though without the regulations. It will be one of the first things that happens once the regulations come in as people will fly slower, because yeah, um, drag is proportional to speed squared, so definitely fly slower. Um, and then thirdly, Synthetic fuels, we're about to discuss that in a separate presentation, but yeah, it's a phenomenal waste of energy and we should definitely use that energy for decarbonizing ground transport. Um, the only thing I'd say is get very rich people that do fly to help fund synthetic fuel development is the, the one good thing about it. Okay. And we finish off with one short question from Tara. Tara, okay. would you like to ask your question? Oh, I was just wondering, how can we find more people like you and help them learn how to flip from the industry? Because I do think the point that the first person was making with regards to we need to make these allies, we need to, like when you work with domestic violence, just working with women doesn't work, right? So how can we find people that work there that we can figure out ways to communicate with them in dialogue and, and, and help them realize that misinformation? Yeah, I, I think, well, that's going to be the focus of um, our working group, Destination 1.5, which is reaching out to pilots and from myself, the aerospace manufacturing. So I've still got links into Rolls-Royce. Sounds like someone else, really interesting group that's in Airbus in France. Um, I've just heard about today that I'm going to look into. So I think our group 
um, hopefully will be a vehicle for that. And if you've got any thoughts of particular companies or particular people that could help. With Swiss that, Air that. is trying to get people to start working for trains, pilots to work for trains. I think I read somewhere in The Guardian recently. Okay, I'll have a look at that. It's a good one for just transition to reference. Thanks. Yeah, great. And no, very important question. How do we kind of broaden that? Um, and that's something that you're, you guys are puzzling over how to engage people effectively and not kind of put people's hackles up or sound like you're some sort of, you know, sort of lefty activist group. <laughs> um, um, great. Um, yeah, fantastic. Thanks for everyone for the questions. Thanks, uh, Finley. That's very informative. Um, I'm sure there might be more questions that we can come to after presentations. Um, for now, Ali, do you want to uh, press on with your presentation? Yeah, hi everybody. I'm just going to um, share my screen with you. Is that showing up okay for everybody? Yeah. Fantastic. Perfect. Great. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about the um, political context for aviation greenwashing and why we're going to be seeing this ramping up at the moment. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about why the concepts of synthetic fuels and negative emissions are um, for solutions and aren't going to fix this in the time frames required. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit about job losses in the sector and the aviation sector's need, um, recent claims that they need special treatment to protect jobs and link this into how um, this is part of a wider false narrative by the industry. And um, finally, why it's so important to challenge the industry on this. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to pick up quickly as well on the point that um, Tahir raised um, in response to Finlay, which I thought was really important that, um, you know, we're talking here about aviation industry greenwashing, but um, I think that absolutely shouldn't be taken to imply that the people who are actually doing the work on developing some of these things within the industry aren't, you know, completely sincere in wanting to decarbonize the industry. Um, the, the issue is more that the people who are running the industry, the people in charge, either don't understand or aren't willing to acknowledge the extent to which the solutions just aren't going to be able to cut emissions sufficiently on the time frame required. Ali, can I just ask you to speak so clearly and slowly even for people with second language English as well? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Sorry, I'll slow, I'll slow down a bit. <laughs> no, no um, cool. So for both airlines and governments, it's no longer possible to deny the fact on climate change. So it's not politically viable to deny that climate change is real or pretend that there's no need to do anything to cut emissions. But there's also huge reluctance to accept that the current model of unlimited cheap flights is unviable or to address the really flawed funding model we've got at the moment where airlines get propped up with public money via tax exemptions and bailouts um, while also making a really significant contribution to the harms caused by the climate crisis. And there's also a reluctance to address the huge inequalities, um, both within countries and between countries, in terms of who gets to enjoy the benefits of air travel and who is suffering from the impacts of a warming climate. So in the UK, for example, just 15% of people take 70% of all flights, and there's a similar pattern in other countries. Um, and this plays out globally. Um, there was recent research finding that just 1% of the global population causes 50% of the emissions from commercial aviation. Um, at the moment, and probably for the next few decades at least, a low emissions alternative to mass travel by plane isn't available. Um, and that's particularly the case for longer journeys. So the industry really has a choice. It can either support um, fair reductions in demand to cut emissions, or it can try to um, uh, construct a narrative in which techno fixes will remove the need to fly less and the industry can continue with business as usual while claiming to be climate friendly. So what we're seeing at the moment is that the industry is going down the route of um, pushing false solutions 
in an attempt to undermine the need for demand management. Um, but the and there's a whole spectrum of solutions um, which the industry is suggesting, but they either um, don't work or they won't actually cut emissions or they won't even exist on the timeframes which are required. In the UK, the government is also supporting these false solutions um, while refusing the need for demand reduction. Um, so it started a new initiative called the Jet Zero Council, which is a mixture of government and industry, and which has the aim of delivering net zero aviation by 2050. So clearly there is a need for R&D into ways to reduce emissions from flying, but um, what we've ended up with in the UK is where this is starting to be subsidised by the taxpayer, by the government, um, rather than being paid for by the industry which is going to benefit from it. So, for example, the government in the UK is investing in a company making alternative fuels, and it's also not um, acknowledging the limits of technical solutions and the fact that action to cut emissions from flying needs to happen now, not be pushed down the road to when these solutions are available. So um, an example of aviation industry greenwashing in the UK is Heathrow Airport. Um, Pre-pandemic, Heathrow was the largest source of um, carbon emissions in the UK. Um, their plans for the third runway would add around another 10 million tonnes of carbon dioxide per year, which in itself would be around a tenth of the UK's remaining carbon budget in 2050, uh, just from that one runway. So Heathrow is very loud about its efforts to cut emissions from its ground-based operations, but that makes up just 5% of the airport's emissions. Um, as you'd expect, 95% of their emissions comes from uh, planes in the sky. Um, so Heathrow has a narrative where it talks about becoming a zero carbon airport, improving its energy efficiency, using renewable energy. But you know, for an airport to describe itself as, um, as zero carbon is, at best misleading. It gives consumers a completely inaccurate impression about the environmental harms that their flight is causing. Um, and also while, while Heathrow is trying to position itself as a company that's really engaged on climate change, um, it's also uh, taking legal action to challenge the um, Court of Appeal judgment that the third runway was unlawful on climate grounds. So there's a, there's a real disconnect between what the industry is saying and what it's actually doing. Um, and this graph is from Heathrow Sustainability Reporting, um, which is setting out how it plans to decarbonize. And you know, it all looks very nice, but as you can see, they've got things like imminent aircraft, future aircraft, sustainable fuels. Well, these things don't actually exist. They're not in operation. They're more of a concept at the moment. And the idea that they're going to you know, spring into action particularly quickly is, you know, founded on a kind of mistaken understanding of the extent to which these technologies can actually develop. Um, the UK government also recently just handed um, more than one million to Flypop, which is an airline that doesn't exist yet, but it claims that it's going to achieve carbon neutrality by buying carbon credits. Um, that doesn't actually undo the emissions from the airline. Um, it just sort of perpetuates a narrative in which it's fine for people living in wealthy countries to keep emitting as long as they pay other people to cut emissions for them. So there's a, um, a range of um, solutions which are being proposed. Um, I think other speakers are going to be talking about offsetting and biofuels. And Finlay's talked about electric or hydrogen planes. So I'm going to briefly cover the issues around synthetic fuels and negative emissions. So synthetic fuels are manufactured from carbon dioxide, which has been captured from the atmosphere. So it is technically possible to do this. Um, and there have been a couple of very small pilot projects but the energy that's required to capture um, carbon dioxide, which is at a relatively low concentration in the atmosphere is huge. And these fuels are likely to remain orders of magnitude more expensive than fossil fuels. 
And there's also concerns that even if these fuels do achieve carbon neutrality, they'd still cause warming because they still emit other greenhouse gases, such as water. Um, there's also the issue that if we were to replace the current demand for aviation uh, for jet fuel with uh, synthetic fuels, the energy that would be needed to capture that much carbon dioxide would be more than the world's current renewable electricity capacity. So this is clearly not a, a sort of, you know, a drop in solution that would allow the industry to just continue as usual. And there's similar issues around um, negative emissions, which is the idea that you can keep on burning jet fuel because you'll just capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it underground and it will balance out. Um, again, this is technically feasible and there have been pilot projects, but it hasn't been done on anything like the scale required. It's also very expensive due to the intrinsic energy costs of capturing gas from the atmosphere. Um, and it also raises issues around permanence and leakage. Um, the current cost of capturing and storing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is around an order of magnitude um, more than the cost of a flight which emits that much carbon dioxide. So you'll be looking at the very least um, plane tickets being 10 times more expensive than they are now, and that's sort of a best case scenario. And then you'd also need to factor in that the actual warming impact of flying is around three times more than just the carbon dioxide emissions. So then what are you going to do? Capture three times more carbon dioxide, which would be 30 times the cost of current of flying at the moment. Another minute, Ali. Right. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I was just gonna quickly talk about um, job losses in the sector and how the um, over the summer we saw the industry calling for um, basically uh, bailouts and special treatment from the taxpayer. But um, we also saw a complete lack of concern from airline bosses for their workers. Um, they got millions in state back loans and they also got access to the furlough scheme, which is meant to protect jobs. But they were also trying to make up to a third of their workforces redundant. Um, British Airways were trying to use the crisis to force their employees onto worse employment conditions and lower wages. So, yeah, just to conclude, the aviation industry is really good at putting out a narrative in which it's vital to the economy, it creates jobs, um, and they're, they're, you know, they're responsible corporate citizens with a plan for action on emissions. And it's easier for governments to accept these unrealistic assessments of the pace at which technologies can develop and be rolled out than it is to tell their voters that actually the way that we travel has to change. But it is really important not to let these um, claims go unchallenged um, because if the industry gets this wrong um, and if it's allowed to continue with unconstrained demand while relying on things like offsetting and biofuels, then that's going to have really, really negative consequences, um, particularly for poorer people in the global south. So it's really important not to let this happen and to keep challenging the narrative. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Ali. That's a, a great summary of, uh, of airlines and, uh, and airports, rather loose relationship with, with sort of the truth. Um, um, are there any, any questions that we come in for, for Ali? If not, we can always press on, but... Hearing no. No We've had some great comments that there are similar narratives coming from Bristol and French airports. Would anyone like to ask a question about some of these synthetic fuels or some of the narrative from the aviation industry? Okay. Well, given given time, let's let's press on with the next presentation, and, and there'll be time for questions again later. Um, Right. Um, yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Ali. Um, Almo, do, do you want to pick up with, uh, with the biofuels and, and offsetting? Uh, yeah, hold on. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, so 
yeah, I um, I'd say some of this will be familiar to some of you who were at previous sessions, um, you know, organized by Stay Grounded, where I presented in aviation biofuels for the simple reason that not very much has changed in that field in recent years. The big change is likely to come in 2022. Uh, more about that in a, in a little bit. So. Uh, first thing to say is that we've heard a lot from Finlay and from um, I, I, Alicia about uh, the type of greenwashing that is about things that are really not likely to happen. That, that wouldn't be bad if they were to happen in terms of the techno pixels necessarily, but they're not very likely. They're really sci-fi options. And the bad thing, of course, is that they legitimize ongoing uh, huge uh, emissions growth uh, by the industry. Biofuels is a different thing because it's a very, very real prospect, not on a large scale as far as the replacement of fossil fuel is concerned, but on a large enough scale to cause really significant damage to forests and communities and also to make climate change even worse. Now, before we actually get onto biofuels, I thought I get the, let's get the idea of a waste um, uh, fuels from waste just out of the way. That is a big thing in the UK at the moment and uh, it's also being hyped in some other countries. So in the UK, uh, you know, you might have on the Net Zero Festival, um, you know, with a, you know this, this very greenwashy event. We had uh, this company Velocis uh, speak, uh, you know, they entered into partnership with British Air, oops, oh uh, no, sorry, with British Airways in Shell. Uh, to make biofuels for mixed solid waste, you know, what could be wrong with it? And basically what's wrong with it is that um, this technology doesn't, ex it, it doesn't exist. It's very, very unlikely to ever work. Uh, and the company Velocis um, is reviving a proposal that's many, many years old um, by, for, by a company they had previously partnered with called Solena that proposed the same thing all over the globe and then went bankrupt, never built anything. And Velocis themselves has no, they've never successfully delivered anything whatsoever. So I can explain in more detail why this can never work, but let's get on to the things that do work. Uh, biofuels. Yes, there is one technology, still only one, and that probably will always be the case, uh, that is um, that is technically feasible and that could be done at least with subsidies in a way that, that airlines um, will do it. And that is based on hydro treatment of vegetable oils and um, animal fats, HVO in short, and then the upgrading. So basically you take plant oils, or animal fats or both, you add hydrogen to it, and then you get something called HVO, and then you split that, you do some a little bit more refining or upgrading, and you get HFA or HIFA, that is aviation biofuels, <coughs> the technical term. It's a picture of a new refinery or newly converted refinery by Lame, uh, the Lame Drum by Total in, uh, in France. And that can give you this idea of scale. This is how big, you know, many of those converted the H3O refineries are. They are gigantic. They are not like, you know, some little biodiesel plants. Uh, now, what is H3O made of? Well, the absolute best feedstocks, there's uh, four. Actually, the best one, the cheapest one is tallow, you know, uh, residues from slaughterhouses. Um, limited amount available, of course, and not very nice stuff either. Uh, then use cooking oil. I mean, that's the cheapest you get, but a drop in the ocean as far as the, the demand is concerned. The still is a technical corn oil, which is left over from, uh, from ethanol refineries. Uh, also quite, that, that amount is not going to grow any further. Ethanol is at its limits in the United States, and they don't get it anywhere else. It's all just US based. And then the biggie is really palm oil and palm oil products, uh, virtually limitless as far as, uh, you know, I mean, limited only by, by um, with a, you know, possible, you know, environmental or, um, restrictions on expansion. Now, less good as a feedstock, uh, so more expensive and less, uh, less good properties is uh, soybean oil. 
But nonetheless, there's at the moment a proposal from a Brazilian company for a large soybean oil refinery in Paraguay for export to North America and Europe. Uh, you know, soybean oil being linked to, I mean, Simona might say something about soybean oil in general, but basically linked to huge um, environmental destruction, deforestation in much of South America and also to, to land grabbing and um, pesticide poisoning and really horrendous impact on local communities and peasant communities. And separately, uh, in the United States, there are massive expansion plans for HVO, including jet fuel, from involving soybean oil underway right now. In fact, I did some, I was sort of trying to update my presentation, my knowledge, and I was absolutely horrified how much had actually been announced since I last did this in, my, in I think, May this, April, May this year. Now, HVO, you can see this line at the top, it uh, it's a fast, it's the smallest but fastest growing type of biofuels. And shockingly, if the plants under construction or announced by the end of last year are all built, you will treble that capacity. And unfortunately, the vast majority of those plants announced uh, will, I believe, go ahead, certainly the ones under construction. Um, so really massive growth uh, in that sector, most of it for land-based use, but in but uh, aviation biofuels is you know is, is really high up there as well. Okay, then something I saw, oh, sorry, I should have had it earlier with soybean oil. We have sort of the issues over um, the feedstocks. Use cooking oil, what could be wrong? Uh, you'll hear, especially in Europe, you know, there's a big refinery being built in the Netherlands, Rotterdam now. They're all speaking of used cooking oil and tallow. Uh, also, some of the refiners in the United States. And um, the problem with that is, well, one is that there isn't that much available. But the other thing is that there is nobody checking what is really in fuel. So, la I think two years ago, there was a big fraud case in the Netherlands resulting in the CEO of a biodiesel company actually going to jail. But the issue underlying under, underneath was that they misclassified um, something else as used cooking oil. And that something else was almost certainly palm oil. Now, and the problem is that that was certified by a scheme called ICC, who certified virtually all the waste and residue-based biofuels in the world. They weren't involved in the fraud. They didn't commit fraud but they failed to prevent it. Very, very weak standard. Um, okay, yeah. So what's the, uh, the other issues is basically, yeah, uh, the two issues with waste and residues are, uh, one, they are very short supply, as I said, but the other one is that they are also, apart from used cooking oil, used by other industries. And those other industries, if they no longer get the tallow, they no longer get that distiller's corn oil, they are going to um, switch to palm oil and in the case of distiller's corn oil, also to soybean oil. So indirectly, you're going to have increased um, tropical deforestation, more land conflicts and more greenhouse gas emissions um, as a result, even of many of the waste, most of the waste and residues. Uh, palm oil then, yeah, that is the cheapest, uh, cheapest FIFA feedstock uh, that's available in large, large quantities. Um, yeah, I mean, I saw, uh, I've got some different term from um, you here. They just published a really, really interesting and shocking, well, not to me shocking, but I think if you didn't know about the company, quite shocking report about the world's biggest HVO and um, producer Neste, Finnish company, owned by the, partly by the Finnish government, uh, and um, said to become the world's biggest biofuel, a biofuel producer for aviation. And despite all the hype about being mega sustainable and all the supply chain being totally audited, uh, Milieu Defensive report shows that they were responsible, their suppliers were responsible to at least 10,000 hectares of rainforest deforestation and at least 13,000 fires on uh, concessions uh, between January, just between January and 2019 and June 2020 alone. Uh, just this morning, as I was reading that report, pop, uh, I saw popping up on my emails in Europe um, a new petition by uh, Rainforest Rescue, Regenwald, worth signing by everybody, please. Um, 
targeting first resources, and they are one of Nestle's suppliers, you know, saying here, stop the destruction of Borneo's, uh, you know, um, an, a rare monkey um, uh, only found in Borneo. Um, so just finishing, finally, sorry, the two drivers of aviation biofuels at the moment. One is Corsia, which Gary will be talking about in a moment. It's the aviation industries and UN adopted scheme to classify all post 2020 aviation growth as carbon neutral, so carbon offsetting and sustainable aviation fuels, most virtually all going to be biofuels. And secondly, very importantly, aviation biofuel targets and subsidies um, introduced by different countries and uh, potentially by larger regions. So yeah, so in summary, you've got this very, very real threat of large scale new demand for palm oil, quite likely also soybean oil linked to deforestation, land conflicts and human rights abuses. That wasn't actually a conclusion, but palm oil biofuels, according to an EU commission studies, are three, three times worse for the climate, even than fossil fuels, um, you know, per, per liter of fuel. And yeah, there is genuinely rapid expansion underway. You know, all the jet fuel refineries being developed, many are due to open in 2022. That's when it'll kick in. But it relies on cost here and by fuel targets and subsidies. And that's it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's a very thorough whistle stop tour, Ahmed, of uh, all of that stuff. Um, fantastic. Does anyone have? Um, any questions uh, on on that presentation on all that all that information? There's been some interesting comments, I think, from people about. Uh... Thank you, Finley might have a question. Uh, oh, do you want me to ask? It? I was just going to say, do you think there? I haven't actually seen like a specific campaign that's said we want aviation companies to stop talking about biofuels. Um, it's funny because they talk about sustainable aviation fuel and often they mean synthetic fuel, and, uh, but they always talk about biofuels as if it's a part of the picture. Do you think there should be a campaign that says almost like zero tolerance on discussing biofuels when it comes to aviation? Yeah, I mean, I think I would love to see there be more more campaigning around aviation biofuels, and I'm afraid biofuel watch really hasn't got the capacity to do that on a you know global large scale at present. Um, I think there is a real, real deficit and a real gap there. I think the important thing from my point, I mean, what I would focus on is trying to stop governments from implementing uh, targets and subsidies for aviation biofuels. There's really bad stuff being you know, being discussed, I think, to some extent approved, especially in Scandinavia at the moment. Uh, and yeah, but there is very, very little campaigning, coherent campaigning going around, uh, going. So, you know, anybody, you know, who has got great ideas, maybe in the later discussions or get in touch with me. Fantastic. Um, Ian, do you have a question? I've got a, I've got a question or a comment. Um, the problem, the problem is the name. People think biofuels are a good thing. It sounds like it should be a good thing, and it, it ties in with the uh, you know carbon neutral airport, um, which are are carbon neutral uh, unless you unless you include the planes and the cars, and then they're not. Um, it's it, it's part of this spin, part of this uh, this this playbook that that we heard about earlier. So we somehow either need to change the name or educate people, you know, what biofuels are. It just sounds like a good thing to the general public. Yeah, I would just say very briefly, there is so there are many groups, especially when there was, you know, a lot of campaigning around um, biofuels or, you know, many groups will call it agrofuels, you know, as being, you know, a term that's also, um, you know, very much referred by especially Latin American groups. Um, 
Personally, I feel the problem is that all the, that when you do a Google search, all the publications that were ever made on agrofuels don't turn up when you search for biofuels. This is why I personally tend to, uh, because, you know, we want our stuff found on Google for, for anything. But yeah, I agree. I mean, it, the terminology is problematic. I wasn't criticizing you. I was saying that as, <laughs> as campaigners, we should be trying to make that point. Yes. and link like the biofuels are a bad thing not a good mm. thing because they sound mm. like they're a good thing yep great great I'm, ian sorry did, it, did ian have a question i think had to hand up yeah uh, ian. yeah it's not so much a question but what i've heard so far and obviously on the biofuels i'm with that one but uh, it seems to be the only solution to the problem is to drastically reduce the amount of aviation because all these uh, ideas that have been put forward uh, don't solve anything. Yeah, I think I think that that's that's a conclusion a lot of people come to. I think. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that might be an interesting topic for for the discussion at the end. Actually, because uh, you know whether whether any of these can be pursued. Um, right. yeah, I just see one from Matthew about lignocellulosic. Um, and I would kind of say we've done a lot of work. I've, I mean, looking into that, and we've done quite a lot of writing. I didn't go into the details as to why making biofuels from solid biomass is not realistic. But you know, really happy to share by emails or so. It's just simply, if I had included that, I would have needed another ten minutes. <laughs> Um, great. I can see there's a couple more questions, but I'm aware that we've already been going an hour and there's a couple more presentations. So if I could just sort of park those for the after the presentation. So please remember them all. By all means, put, pop them in the chat. Um, um, but uh, yeah, sorry, we're just I'm just aware of time. Um, Gary, can um, someone got Gary's slides that they can pop up and Gary can cover some stuff about Porcia. Thank you so much. And I really do want to thank everyone. Uh, for attending the session today and, and really for the crew at Stay Grounded for organizing this and everyone on this panel. Uh, my name is Gary Hughes again and I'm working with Biofuel Watch in, in California. I'm, I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area and I am attempting to kind of make a bridge as it were between Al Muth's presentation and Simone's presentation. We want to address uh, Corsia the carbon offsetting reduction scheme for international aviation, which I, I believe to some degree, most everyone who is attending this panel has some familiarity with. Um, I, I don't have a slide really to get into the emission trading system of Corsia, but to really quickly point out uh, that as far as emission trading systems go, uh, Corsia is particularly egregious because they don't even put a cap on emissions. And the whole idea with Corsia is that you can grow emissions infinitely and essentially by using two mechanisms, biofuels and carbon offsetting, that you can attain quote unquote uh, carbon neutrality. Um, that's, there's nothing further uh, from, from the truth and really this whole idea that you can set a baseline on emissions and continue to grow those emissions and offset the emissions growth to attain some sort of climate uh, responsibility is is really out there. It doesn't fit with the science at all. Uh, carbon offsetting, there's a couple of issues, you know, people oftentimes bring up, they're concerned about leakage. The idea, for instance, if I protect a forest in one place, it gets logged in another, whether or not there's additionality, uh, whether there's double crediting, are credits being counted in different places or not. Um, but fundamentally, what I wanted to get into with um, my slides here, and I saw the first one, come up really quickly yeah. um, is that there's something much deeper wrong with promoting offsets. And basically I, I talk about it as a sort of soft climate science denial. Uh, there's a, a misrepresentation of how humans are disturbing global carbon cycles when the magical thinking is promoted that forests are going to somehow scrub the atmosphere from the emissions that are created by burning fossil fuels. And so a slide I often use is really just this very basic, basic kind of graphic representation of the carbon cycles, distinct carbon cycles that operate on this planet in which we live. Um, and really 
the idea of carbon trading, the pollution trading when it comes to carbon markets is based on the idea that a ton is a ton. A ton anywhere is a ton. And so we can just trade them around and everything. And um, one thing that we want to recognize is that when it comes to carbon accounting in the land sector is that it is a statistical estimation. It is uh, an estimation that has a pretty broad margin of error. And so when they talk about a ton is a ton, it doesn't really make any sense because still with all the efforts to develop methodology, you can't really measure exactly how much carbon is there in this unit that they generate from the land sector. We'll move on to the next slide. I'm gonna really quickly just go through some of the science so that participants here feel uh, really well grounded in the future when you challenge the idea of carbon offsetting uh, to make sure first and foremost uh, that when we think about carbon sequestration in the land sector and especially in forests, that you have to think about it in the context of past deforestation and land use. So it is not going to neutralize the emissions from fossil fuel when the forest is regrowing to restore the carbon that was lost from past land use, from the deforestation that occurred. The truth is, is that the emissions from burning fossil fuels can only go back to where they come, came from in an exceptionally long period of time. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide really quickly. So let's be really honest with ourselves when we talk about climate change. And I think everyone here in this uh, panel is probably pretty solid on, uh, you know, understanding the issues with offsets. Simone is going to get more into the cultural and social and political impacts from offsets. But to make sure everyone knows that carbon cycles are very dynamic. If we look at the land sector, for instance, and the Western United States, fire has always been a big part of forest evolution. So there's always these natural processes where flows of carbon are moving between the atmosphere, land and oceans. But what humans started to do 150 plus years ago is start to mobilize carbon that had literally been locked away for millions of years. And it's this carbon that's being injected into the already existing natural processes between the atmosphere, land, and oceans that is causing the climate problem. More, more than anything, though, it is important to recognize that the loss of permanent carbon stocks from forests is also a major issue uh, when it comes to the increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And if we were to lose all of the remaining old growth forests on this planet, we'll shoot right past all of the temperature uh, thresholds that we're trying to avoid. Um, but to know and to always recognize that burning fossil fuels is essentially a one-way injection of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. I've got one last slide here to wrap up some of the science, just to make sure we know there's a real physical limit to how much carbon could be stored in the land sector. So one way to imagine it is if we were able to, for instance, restore all of the forests on the planet to the original old growth, ancient forest state, that it would really only compensate for a bit more of a decade uh, of our current use of uh, fossil fuels. So obviously there's no way the land sector can soak it all back up. To remember that climate mitigation, forest rest restoration, it's an imperative, but all we're doing is paying back the carbon debt that was incurred from the original land use. Always remember that question about past deforestation. Now, one of my bullet points here to point out, oftentimes forest offsets are justified as being a means of keeping forest standing, but nothing could be further from the truth from my in-depth study of dozens and dozens of carbon offset projects and forests, there's always logging involved. And the reason why they're able to get away with it is they give harvested wood products a special sequestered carbon value. But that's not true. Those will all uh, end up uh, in the atmosphere uh, uh, at the end of the game. So, um, you know, my last point here before I pass it on to Simone, because my idea was to bridge between the biofuels question, of course, yeah, into the uh, impacts on communities from forest offsetting with the discussion 
about uh, forest offsets is to know that we must reduce emissions from all sources. Uh, we must keep carbon stored permanently where it is. And so that's why I keep it in the ground is really very uh, strongly rooted in climate science. And also we do need to protect forests. I never want anyone to get distracted from the imperative to protecting forests. So I may just pass this on to Simone, or if there are, I would leave this up to Callum if we want to get into questions now or save those for a little bit later. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Gary. That's great. Um, I think if, if there's any to direct, you know, specific questions about some of the, one of the things or some of the things that Gary said. Um, I think Nick had a point, and Mathieu? Mathieu, did you have a... Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah sorry, I was a little uh, interrupted by, by my kids. Uh, just to say, there are, maybe we should emphasize the fact that uh, Biogenic, uh, the, the biogenic origin of uh, energy doesn't mean that it's carbon neutral. And there are very, very, a very good, uh, I'm not a specialist, I'm not a scientist, but uh, I try to read such uh, things. And uh, it's been shown that a lot of the, the carbon we're trying to, to, uh, to get when we're uh, um, doing um, biofuels, actually remains in the sky. So uh, uh, I would uh, advise people to, to talk more about the, this illusion. It's uh, a lot of an illusion to say that uh, biofuels, it's, in fact, it's the answer to, to the question asked a few minutes ago, uh, why people think it's, it's um, something positive because biofuels sounds positive. The reason is that people mix up uh, both notions uh, biogenic and carbon neutral. And there is a big uh, um, delay in time and uh, everything is not, uh, of course, uh, stored back in the, into the ground. That's what I mean. Great, yeah, no, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. Um, we also have a question from Bernardina. There is, but I'm aware that's not exactly, this sort of might be better in the general discussion only because it's not specifically on what Gary was that sort of stuff. Um, so Bernardino, if you don't, if that's okay, we'll, we'll park that for, for the discussion uh, sort of after um, Simona's uh, presentation. Um, Simona, who oh, is that? Is that a specific, uh, sorry, we'll pick that up Bernardino afterwards anyway, sorry, um, if I've misunderstood that. Simona, Okay, I hope everybody can see the presentation and hear me though. Uh, once again, hi from Paraguay. Uh, so I'll try to build on Almut and Gary's presentation, particularly on all the presentations, but especially on those to uh, show a little bit more how some of these false solutions that have been presented work out uh, in, in a continent like Latin America. Um, wait. No. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I would already talked. Uh, so there's two big classes of false solutions that really impact also on on indigenous peoples, local communities, women, and also their forests and and biodiversity in the south. On the one hand, there's biofuels, bioenergy in general. Uh, there's some experimenting with ex alternative sources of fuel that might involve trees as well. And the other is uh, these forest carbon offsets. Um, Albert already said a lot of very good things about uh, what the problems are with biofuels. I must say, uh, listening to the discussion, they have tried to use this term agrofuels. It's not just that it didn't come up in Google, but it's just, it isn't picked up then by governments. You need to, you know, address the term that is being used and unravel that term so that it is very important that if you want to campaign against biofuels, you talk about biofuels because it's not uh, you know, you also will not make people understand why it's biofuels that's really 
uh, problematic, just to, to respond to that discussion, which is interesting indeed. As you see in this slide, you know, if you really would want to have a massive replacement of fossil fuels in general by bioenergy crops, most of the land by 2095 that we have on this planet will be covered by bioenergy crops. You could forget about forests, you could forget about other unmanaged land. You know, there would only be a little bit of managed forest, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and basically a significant part of, of the world will be covered by these crops. So this is really a disaster scenario. And even the IPCC has admitted that, you know, there's too many trade-offs basically to this kind of scenario. Ahmed already talked about uh, palm oil impacts. I think I'm, for interest of time, I will not add a lot by that. I think indeed the report that was just launched by uh, Milieu Defense, the Friends of the Net Earth Netherlands also shows very clearly how devastating some of these impacts can be. This is in Honduras where uh, all palm plantations are associated with really massive violence. There's been land grabbing, assassinations. Some of you may have heard of Berta Cáceres who was assassinated a couple of years ago. And this is all in the rush to produce uh, palm oil, which is the most uh, uh, likely source of, of, of uh, alternative to kerosene. About soya, uh, monoculture, soy monocultures are deaths. Uh, this is the National Farmers uh, Peasant uh, Federation that is uh, campaigning against soy monocultures here in Paraguay particularly, but also in, in Brazil and Argentina. Uh, people are really opposing soy. It's a very, very destructive crop. And one of the biggest problems with this crop is really that to produce it in an efficient way, uh, it's best done when it's very labor extensive. So you use very, produce very little jobs, causing massive depopulation because there's no jobs at the countryside anymore. A very uh, input intensive, and particularly the variety that has been developed that is most used in Latin America is Roundup Ready soy, which is a special form of genetically modified soy that's ready to survive some of the most poisonous herbicides that have been ever invented uh, by Monsanto and co. Uh, those uh, cause cancer at large scale. They cause all kinds of birth defects among children living near to the, uh, the uh, newborn babies that are born near to the soy plantations massive health impacts all over the countryside and this all to produce so-called biodiesel. Sadly, this uh, model of soy production is very much defended by the government in countries like uh, Paraguay. This are, these are military trying to defend the spraying of soy by with these kinds of very dangerous herbicides against protest by the local communities. One of the biggest things that I actually see going from uh, both, which is relevant to both biofuels and also very much to on carbon offsets, is this whole idea that there is enough land to do these things on and that you can compensate, you know, all these, these, these emissions by using massive amounts of land. And this boils down by this idea that there are these degraded lands. And of course, degraded lands are never found in people's backyards. They're always found in very far away places, preferably in continents like Latin America. So this is what you would call a degraded land in Brazil, in the Atlantic forest. It has been degraded primarily by cattle farming, I should uh, emphasize. I mean, beef production and soy production are still the main cause of deforestation in Latin America. Please think of that next time you order dinner. Um, but after the cattle you know, is gone and these lands are no longer used for cattle farming, the question is what will happen to them? By classifying them as degraded, it sort of assumes you can do anything with them. Uh, and that it doesn't matter. However, these lands in the Atlantic forest zone have a 75% chance of growing back into forest by two, in 50 years with, if nobody does anything, if you just set them aside. So what you do is that basically you prevent these lands from recuperating into forests. And this is now happening throughout Latin America actually, and in a lot of places in the world where ecosystems could naturally regrow into, uh, uh, where degraded land could naturally regrow into full-fledged ecosystems like forests in 50 or 100 years, provided they're not being used for the production of bioenergy crops or 
monoculture tree plantations. So I'll get to the monoculture tree plantations next, just to build a little bit on what uh, uh, Gary already very clearly exploited. And I, I will not uh, repeat his argument, but focus a little bit on some of the others. I do want to introduce an abbreviation here that some people might have heard of that is reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and enhancing forest carbon stocks, red plus. And of course, this also, you know, sounds so nice. Um, it sounds like such a nice concept. And the idea was basically that, you know, people should be paid for the favor of conserving or restoring their forest. And that that carbon that is then sequestered by that, or the carbon that's sequestered by planting trees, basically, which is where that forest carbon, enhancing forest carbon stock stands for, that that carbon can then indeed compensate for uh, fossil fuel emissions. Now, as Gary already said, this is based on a very flawed calculation of climate change impacts of forest uh, due to deductive accounting approaches. To say it in non-carbon slang, you know, the basic thing is that a forest means a lot more for the climate than just being, you know, a bu bunch of carbon. You know, forests also regulate rainflow, which at this moment is actually exceptionally important here on the continent because we have been facing massive droughts, not just in, in the Amazon, but also, for example, in Paraguay. But the fascinating thing is that our droughts and the subsequent forest fires have been caused partly by the deforestation in the Amazon because they're now calculating that the big rain flowers we do to get from this big forest about 5,000 kilometers to the north are now being broken up. So this is also not an impact of forest and it's just not taken into account in all these forest carbon offsetting games. Of course, rights, biodiversity, gendered socioeconomic values are also not taken into account. Uh, Gary already talked about this concept of permanence. It's very simple. You can plant a tree, but you cannot guarantee it will survive. In a continent like Latin America, where there's increasing more forest fires, these trees will burn down in a lot of cases. But also, you know, if you plant a wrong tree in the wrong season or the wrong place, it will simply die. They've had tree planting project in China in which 80% of the trees died. Leakage and commodity driven indirect land use change, sorry. This is actually important to realize. You can pretend to, you know, offset your emissions by protecting a certain forest, but if people continue to eat meat, you know, the production of beef and soy will just move to another place. So it doesn't really help unless you also dare look at reduction. And then indeed the flawed base sound, uh, uh, baselines and zero emissions assumption. Here also the basics, to say that very simply, the nasty assumption of red plus is that people have the right to burn down a forest and you need to pay them not to do that. That the business of usual is deforestation. And that's actually a very unethical assumption. So all this, because of, you know, it's now getting very attractive to just, you know, receive money for conserving forests has led to a massive commodification of forest, you know, and these forest carbon sequestering capacities. To calculate exactly how much carbon is being sequestered in forests is very expensive. You call that the MRV, the monitoring, reporting and verification cost. That is so complicated, that process to really calculate that. And the money for that mainly goes to consultancies. And sadly, up to 70% of a lot of forced carbon offset process, uh, projects is, spending, is being spent on MRV. That means on expensive consultants and not on actually conserving forest or you know, benefiting the forest communities that live there. There are so-called environmental social safeguards. They are non-buying, binding though. And what we've seen in practice is that because they're non-binding, not being adhered to, and because forest lands have become so much more attractive to be sold for this forest carbon offsets, you know, a lot of forest lands are being bought or grabbed nowadays. Um, and that is very much to the detriment of the indigenous peoples and local communities that used to live in that forest. And then last but not least, a very sad thing about this whole business is that any collection of trees is being counted as a forest. So because of the lack of proper forest definition, it's actually not deforestation anymore that has become the biggest threat to the world forest, but the replacements of real forest by monoculture tree plantations. These are some of the figures from 2015 of the amount of monoculture tree plantations that you find in different Latin American countries. These are massive. 
I'll just zoom in on two of the biggest players, which are Brazil and Chile. So Brazil is a very big one in forced carbon offsets, and it has already had massive conflicts with these monoculture tree plantations, as you see here, uh, between days and, for example, the indigenous peoples that used to live in these places, or the so-called Quilombero communities. These are uh, Afro-American, Afro-Brazilian communities that still live a lot uh, in these rural areas. A classical example, and we've actually have elaborated two case studies, as Corina already mentioned earlier today, that we will launch later today. So this is already a first take of those, some, some information from those case studies. Um, just two examples here, the plantar uh, was a, one of the very first forced carbon offsets in projects in the world, actually. Uh, it received five million US dollars from what, what that, those days was called the World Bank Prototype Carbon Fund, in which, with which the World Bank very much tried to promote forced carbon offsets all over the world. And it registered as first one of the first clean development mechanism projects in 2009. As you may have heard earlier, clean development mechanisms projects are the projects that are now being allowed to classify in the future as Corsia offsets. Um, so Planta claimed to sequester carbon by growing eucalypt and to produce as renewable energy. This is, this is actually where bioenergy and offsets are coming together. That renewable energy is charcoal and it's primarily used for the steel and iron industry in Brazil. Uh, Ironically, this you know, plantation has gotten a new contribution from climate finance, this time from the Global Environment Facility for a so-called sustainable iron and steel production uh, project, uh, which is subsidizing the expansion of eucalypt plantations to produce so-called sustainable car uh, uh, charcoal. Um, and it will thereby have produce some 300,000 extra tons per year and this will all go to the steel and iron industry, which is actually the largest source of industrial emissions in Brazil. And the industry itself has admitted that without this kind of subsidy, a lot of plants would actually have to close down. So thanks to the global environmental facility, an industry is being kept alive. That's actually the largest source of industrial emissions in Brazil. An inherent thing about both plantations actually of, of a monoculture of, of trees, but also of soy, is that they provide very little employment per hectare of land. As said, this is causing massive social havoc because it's causing depopulation. People do not have a job anymore. I have to go to the cities or to other forest areas to, to, to get some land for agriculture. They also provide very irregular and dangerous and unhealthy jobs, particularly uh, negatively impacting women who receive also less pay. These women have to often apply very dangerous herbicides like the glyphosate I already mentioned. Of course, this also impacts on the communities nearby. Actually, this community, which I visited two years ago, about 50% of that community, which was surrounded by monoculture tree plantations, was half or fully blind because of glaucoma, all called by pesticides used in the plantation around it. Forests and ecosystem are being destroyed and replaced by these monoculture tree plantations. It's estimated that about 200,000 hectares of forest a year are being uh, destroyed. And of course, this also then destroys the livelihoods of women and men, depending on these forests. Water resources are being depleted and contaminated, especially eucalyptus is requiring massive amounts of water. It is a tree that originally is from Australia, drying in very dry zones. And it's so attractive that if you give it a lot of water, it will grow very fast. That's why it's become very attractive as a, a tree for monoculture, fast growing tree plantations. However, that also means that it sucks away all the water around it and causing massive problems for the communities that live around it. Here again, the uh, indigenous people's community you see on the left side, they had conquered their land back from the monoculture tree plantation company but it's still surrounded by these plantations and they now discovered they conquered back land without any sources of water. The water is of course also contaminated by all these uh, pesticides and herbicides that are being used. And for example, Plantar has already, there's already a lot of evidence that they and some of the other uh, companies that are involved in this uh, project are involved in illegal land grabbing amongst indigenous peoples. There have been uh, evidence of uh, death threats against some of the environmental defenders of their lands. 
There has been assassinations, uh, of course, not uh, clarified. And there's all kinds of other human rights uh, violations. And there's also a lot of research around corruption around these plantations. Uh, if you could wrap up shortly, if someone yeah. asks, that's okay. I just have a few more slides. Right. There's a lot of empty promises of plantations to support rural development. This is a program of uh, rural territorial development of one of the plantation companies, which is now actually being sucked up into Susano. As you see, it's pretty empty. There's also false uh, claims that they are conserving land. Please know that every landowner in Brazil is required legally to conserve 25% of its land under forest cover. And they then call that a high you know, conservation area. And very cynically is that in the same area where actually these plantations are based, for example, the landless farmers movement has reconquered also some of the lands and they're now using that same land for agroecology project, providing 10 times more employment, providing food and providing a lot more biodiversity. Women have taken the lead in these kinds of projects. Very briefly about Chile, which is another giant in the field of monoculture tree plantations. There, uh, they have massively expanded also because they received until recently a state subsidy of about 75% for establishment of the first three years of operation. Uh, this has led to widespread deforestation throughout Chile, especially in the south, and land grabs amongst especially the indigenous Mapuche people, leading to a very violent conflict uh, over land in these indigenous territories. It's especially here again, the women who suffer most. Um, and the clean development mechanism also here has registered actually a Valdivia biomass plant which is part of a bigger forestry complex of Cellulose Arauco and Constitución S.A., uh, which is selling now carbon credits, which will be ready for sale to uh, Corsia as well, to the aviation industry as well. Um, and uh, the, just to say that this plant actually also caused a significant contamination of the Cusas River, that's the river you see on, on the other uh, picture, uh, which has caused, you know, massive uh, hazard for the communities live there and also the deaths of some thousands of black neck uh, swans. This is happening actually all over the continent for interest of time. I won't go in depth in other countries, but for example, these are plantations in Paraguay that until recently had actually quite little plantations and now they're massively expanding thanks to climate finance. So this is where, for example, green climate fund funds are going to, to these kinds of monoculture tree plantations. And then last but not least, this is my uh, last, last substantive slide. Plantations have a negative impact in Europe too, because these plantations in Europe are also being funded through forced carbon offset projects, including those offered by companies like KLM. This is actually the Netherlands. Actually, this is the area where my parents lived for 30 years. Uh, it's a protected area. Uh, called the Salonse Heuvelrug, the Holterberg. Um, and well, it looks like, you know, of course you can see with your own eyes that the biodiversity impact is quite negative of these kinds of monoculture tree plantations. There's actually an attempt to reform them into uh, normal forest, but sadly uh, that is not going fast enough. And that's also because they now need fast growing wood for bioenergy in the Netherlands. But the other cynical thing is that it is always said that there were no social impact of these plantations. But I did a historical research to this plantation, and that was partly because the people were basically moved from the land at the time that the plantation was established, which is more than a century ago. So now there are no people anymore to have a conflict anymore, but they used to be there. So thank you very much. I hope it wasn't too fast. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, or things that I try to skip for interest of time, please feel free to, to uh, ask them. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Simona. There's yeah, lots of examples and, and information in there. Um, does anyone have any uh, any sort of direct questions on on Simona's presentation? And I'm aware that Steve, I think you're on the phone, so you can't type in the uh, in the chat, but uh, shout if you have a question. Um. I do, but it's not a direct one to Simone. Shall we? Well, let's take that up in a minute. Let's just see if there are any sort of yeah. direct responses then to, to Simone first. Um, does anything come in, Sally, that you've noticed? No. Pablo had a comment uh, about Colombia. 
Oh, Pablo shared a, yeah, he shared a, a documentary, which sounds very interesting, actually. It does. And Finley has just typed a question. Would you like to say your question, Finley? Yeah, I, I just, I, something that was also at the back of my mind is that if you offer a market for offsets, either reducing energy consumption or um, protecting a forest, does it not lead a lot of countries that are looking for the offsets to set very weak targets in terms of deforestation or in terms of energy reduction, emissions reduction, when it gets to the Paris Agreement or you know the, the agreement in Glasgow next year, if we have this big offset market that makes it lucrative to exceed your targets, does it also lead to countries submitting weak ones, which is exactly the opposite of what we want? Exactly. Absolutely. A uh, very good question. At least in the field of deforestation, this has been a very huge problem. Because as I said, you know, one of the obscene things with this whole Red Plus scheme is that it assumes that deforestation is normal. And please know the Sustainable Development Goals, I don't know if you've all heard of those, you know, which were adopted in 2015. They set a target that by, you know, 31st of December of this year, 2020, deforestation and forest degradation should be halted. That's the target in the Sustainable Development Goals. Yet Red Plus assumes that it's normal to deforest. Uh, and, you know, and if then the deforestation is slightly reduced, people should be paid for it and countries should be paid for it. And it's actually been very obscene to see what the Green Climate Fund, which is the biggest climate fund in the world, is doing with that. Because they have very <coughs> big rights in this area. It was 100 million, million give, given to Brazil. And I'm sure everybody's heard about the massive deforestation of forest fires in Brazil at the moment, but it was for the reduction of deforestation they had between 2014 and 2016. Now, 2015 happened to be a very uh, bad year in just accidentally in both Paraguay and Brazil. And both Paraguay and Brazil have now received massive amounts of money for the fact that there was less deforestation in those years. Well, the only thing that was happened is that it was to wet part a forest fire. You know, and this deforestation happening because a lot of landowners deliberately or accidentally put on fire in their, la in, in their forest, then there's a very dry season. And it's always dry in, in August, so that's normally the forest fire season. But because they had this one bad year, they could claim, oh, look, we, we reduced deforestation. They got $100 million for that. And needless to say, those trees are not standing anymore. You know, two, three years later, they're all gone. So this is what Red Plus looks like in practice. You know, these kinds of countries that in Paraguay also certainly doesn't have any intention to actually halt deforestation. You know, they at most want to reduce it a little bit, but compared to a baseline. So yes, and they have said that their normal commitment, you know, would be to, that their normal scenario would be to have a lot of deforestation, uh, like Brazil says that it will only combat illegal deforestation, which is of course nonsense because the government decides what's legal and what's illegal. So that's like the biggest scam in the world. Um, but, you know, that's their baseline. That's their commitment for Paris. And then, you know, if they do a little bit more, they claim amounts like hundred million dollar. This is climate finance money that's going there. So anyhow, this is the green climate fund for anyone who wants to know more about that fund. It's, it's really cynical. And this is also the kind of scheme just to say that your Prince Charles in UK, for example, is promoting, you know, the Prince Charles Foundation and, you know, the nature based solutions. Actually, I should mention this also, you know, nowadays you call all this stuff nature based solution. And you yeah. even have people like George Monbiot, whom a lot of you probably also know, who are promoting this stuff, like that this is a great idea to actually, you know, conserve forests. But I mean, what you happen in practice is all this scam happening in, in countries like, like Brazil. <coughs> Great, thank you. Um, Steve. Yes, hello. Um, it's Steve from Rising Tide UK here. Uh, it follows on from what Simone just said, actually. Um, well, it never ceases to amaze me how many NGOs that have magazines, um, including them, a littering of ecotourism adverts that you can only fly to. Um, and eco-friendly travel partners that they've done deals with. Even some of the rail ones um, encourage you to offset your journey by buying carbon credits using old red schemes. But um, 
nature-based solutions or natural climate solutions, as some people like XR call them, seems to be the flavour of the month at the moment. And I have a, a, a real fear that by this time next year, with natural climate solutions on the agenda for the biodiversity COP in China in October, um, and a discussion on um, commodification and attaching market mechanisms to them, that by the time we get to the climate COP in Glasgow next year, we'll have a deal already stitched up on natural um, nature-based solutions. So uh, back in the summer, uh, we tried to get some stay grounded people together using the stay grounded discussion list to pull all these strands, um, primarily Corsia, but pull all the other full solution and greenwashing strands together to try and write a paper that encompasses all those things. But we had, um, even though we agreed it at the last network meeting, we didn't really have much interest. So I think this excellent webinar uh, is a good place to try and relaunch that. And I'm going to put a, a, an email on the list in a minute uh, calling for people to, to get involved. But as part of that, it would be great if the speakers tonight, if they have a written version of what they've said, I know it's being recorded, um, if they can send that to us uh, and maybe get involved themselves in, in drafting, drafting that paper. Because I think, particularly in the UK, being involved with the COP26 Coalition of Civil Society Groups, that because of Corsia, people are looking to toward aviation campaigners to do the debunking of offsets again, even though we did it, what, 15 years ago, uh, to do that again, because more and more NGOs in the UK, at least it seems, are becoming ambivalent towards them. Uh, they may not support them, but ambivalence is just as bad. Great, thank you. That's a, that's a, that's a fantastic practical application of some of this stuff. So yeah, that'd be great to get people involved in, in publicizing this. Um, no, no, I'm happy. I'll just put a link into the chat of one of the papers we just did, which is really like, a, well, beginner's guide, but you know, an explanatory guide to discussing Red Plus. Yeah, that's good. Fantastic. Um, right. I mean, so we've, we've got about 20 minutes to go. Um, I think one one thing I did just want to say, I'm aware that alongside all these kind of relatively, well, more concrete solutions like hydrogen and like uh, offsets and, and carbon credits, there's a there's a big kind of policy backdrop that um, that has been referred to with Red Plus and uh, you know, Corsia and all these other policy bits, which we haven't gone into detail with. So um, I think if there are uh, links, we've put, put um, Gary put a good summary of Corsia in the in the chat, and I put another one in. Um, I think I'm aware that there's that backdrop people might not be so familiar with, um, um, but maybe that's something we can put together some uh, some materials for that people can can refer to afterwards. Um, so I'm aware there's, there's a lot a lot of stuff there that we that we don't have time to go into in detail because it's it's really quite sort of arcane. Um, but sorry if that's a bit sort of alienating. Um, yeah, I think for the last let's just for the last twenty minutes, just go through some of the questions that we haven't been able to pick up on so far, and, and just open the floor a bit more um, to a sort of more um, more of a sort of discussion forum with uh, with questions with speakers or, or or other sort of inputs. Um, Sally, were there some left questions? I think uh, Nick had a question. Nick, did you have a question earlier that you wanted to? No, it's okay, thank you. Okay. And Ton had a question. Yeah, that was also addressed already. Thanks. Okay, great. And um, Bernardino, would you like to ask your question? Are you still there, Bernardino? Right, thanks, Gary. Gary's going to run away as well, actually. Um, Bernardino, we do, you were just there, may have gone, may have disappeared. Okay. Well, any any more questions or, or contributions or thoughts, or we could we could also pick up on on Ian's reflection earlier as, 
of whether whether we have to actually just cut flights to is probably is the only way to to, to cut carbon. But um, any more questions about or thoughts about full solutions, greenwashing, um, just, offsetting? Yeah, sure. We have to cut flights, um, but I think actually that we shouldn't underestimate the risk of this greenwashing schemes because there's so many people who really really think that they oh yeah yeah you know it's bad for the climate but as long as i offset it's okay uh and and i think what that was just said of steve it's it's so right you know and these conservation organizations have such a financial stake into this money coming into web plus i mean there, there's organization that gained 400 million out of the scheme you know nature conservation organizations you know something with a black and white beer uh but so you know, and, and these are the stakeholders, and that's why they're promoting this, because they know they can earn a lot of money out of this. And then they're just forgetting about the impacts on the climate and the impacts on, on biodiversity communities on the ground. You know, because it's their money making scheme to pretend they are conserving this stuff. Uh, and yeah, the ecotourism thing is a very big one as well on that. And, and that's actually really shocking how much ecotourism promotion there has been. But here again, it's the very conservation organizations that are making a lot of money on this. And so they overlook the aviation impacts. And, and it's complicated because there's countries, and I should speak a little bit for the global south here. You know, there are countries which have at this moment are dependent 80% or so on, on, on tourism. You know, if you just take that away and, and you know, if it's if it's Dominican Republic, you know, we have a member there, there's not a lot of alternatives. But having that said, precisely our member group in the Dominican Republic is now trying to, you know, fight for a just transition away from tourism. So it's also, you know, tackling this whole tourism industry. I think that's very much related. It's a very good point. Yeah, I think that's we do need to think about not just aviation, but the, the wider web of, of industries and tourism is a very, very obvious one. Um, I think Ms. Juan might have a question. Well, a contribution actually to the discussion. Um, what I feel is that um, the amount of emissions that uh, uh, the aviation is going to put into the atmosphere and the amount of climate change that they are going to uh, produce over the next years or have produced already uh, is uh, um, very very big so i think it would be very useful um, to keep pounding on the fact that all small solutions uh, are not going uh, to help and that's also why i think that uh, the uh, the information that finlay gave over on the uh, enormous growth of uh, aviation uh, is uh, helpful uh, and then um, you know, if you combine that with the information that uh, uh, that um, Simona gave on the uh, the the, uh, the negative effects of uh, these type of schemes, if you combine it with what Elmut has said about uh, how uh, totally nonsense biofuels are, uh, then I think it is very clear that the only way forward to have aviation play a role in a future uh, in a sustainable future is that it, uh, the amount of flights diminishes a lot. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we have had a study where 8% uh, of the people, they fly 40% of the, uh, the flights and 80% of the flights are fun flights shopping in, in Barcelona. And of course, it's a very important uh, that uh, international trade and um, uh, that, that tourism for uh, third world countries is uh, uh, considered to be a very important source of income. Uh, but uh, I think when you keep pounding on the, uh, the information, I think it's very important because it's too often that uh, governments, national governments, um, uh, airports, um, they get away with, you know, just stating obvious, very big, broad schemes and 
it's very helpful if we can then can say, but you know, this and this and this and this are the facts. Fantastic. Yeah, thank I, you. I think Bernadina is having trouble with her audio and her mic, but she's got a question I'm getting, especially for Almud. Do biofuels reduce carbon emissions or are there supposed carbon savings in the life cycle of biofuels? Uh -huh. Almud or, or anyone else want to pick that one up? No, it's okay. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute. So, um, yeah, I mean, on emissions, we've already spoken about palm oil biofuels, right? Um, now, I can give you an example on palm oil biofuels in course here. So, I'd, you know, what's kind of expected is that, um, I didn't go into that earlier, but basically companies like Neste and biofuel companies are, you know, they are not, you know, they know that crude palm oil is not very popular with, you know, with basically with the public, you know, it's, it's very, uh, very hard to claim that that is climate friendly. So what they do is they are, you know, Neste is um, to a far larger extent, you know, pushing and using um, a fraction of, of crude palm oil, uh, a palm oil product, and claiming that that is a res waste and residue, uh, even though, yeah, it is a fraction of crude palm oil, basically, um, and the climate impacts of burning it are pretty much or more or less equivalent. Um, now, and of course here, uh, greenhouse gas uh, rules and standards, um, yeah, this, uh, you know, this fraction called palm fatty acid distillate or PFAD uh, will definitely uh, pass as low carbon. Uh, so, you know, this is just one example. And, you know, like I said, you know, the, you know, even on waste and residues, yes, if, if you don't look at the wider the displacement impact, the genuine waste and residues, then yes, it's a positive carbon balance. But if you look at the wider balance, uh, so the wider indirect impact, then it is absolutely the opposite, and that is being ignored. So you know, in short, no. I mean, they, you know, many will make climate change even worse than using no biofuels at all. The bulk of them will. Great, thank you. Um, any any more questions or thoughts? Well, basically on uh, the the same question, if you um, look at the um, calculations, then it's very obvious that first of all, if you use palm oil, you cut a lot of uh, um, native forests, and this is, has an enormous amount of CO two emissions, and that's why a liter of bio fuel from palm oil has three times the amount of CO2 emissions as the fossil kerosene that you replace. And secondly, if you have a, an acre of uh, land and you put, uh, say, uh, an energy crop on it, like maize or um, an, an oil palm, then the same amount of uh, space could generate 50 to 100 times more energy if you put solar panels on it. So it's really a very uh, inefficient way and nonsensical way to, um, to try to reduce CO2 emissions by using um, biofuels. Yeah, interesting point. Uh, Simona, you put a star in. Yeah, no, I totally agree with Tan and just to add one more dimension to what he said, um, please, we should also fight for taking into account this lost restoration opportunity. And this is not in any kind of accounting system yet. So what is being said, I mean, there are already sadly so many lands also in Indonesia, you know, deforested. So the palm oil industry, especially when they target the more critical markets, uh, they will now say, oh no, but this is, you know, palm oil from already deforested land. But also in, in Indonesia, if you food, would stop using those lands for oil palm, you know, the forest would go back. So you potentially lose that forest. And that kind of, you know, regrowth, there's no calculations of that. And here in, in you know, this, they just started the official decade on, on restoration. We need to restore. I think someone mentioned all the issue of, you know, the carbon debt, uh, Gary. 
you know, that's a very important point. We need to restore so many forests, so many other ecosystems, you know, and by keeping that land on the soil or palm oil cover, you take away that opportunity and those lost emissions have to be taken into account as well. And then this whole biofuel cycle is completely negative, you know, because you would sequester so much more carbon if you would just let the, the natural forest grow. May I just say one more, oh, actually also by some, inspired by something Tom said, you know, about a reduction. I think, I know this is quite a heavy discussion, it's partly for tomorrow, but I, 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 it's Corina who will join tomorrow, so if I can just put, we've been struggling a lot about this uh, initiative to have zero flights, you know, no, 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 no aviation anymore. And I know, and I really admire people who make that commitment and say, okay, for me it's not much. During the tourism webinar that actually Corina mentioned this afternoon, we had a community, an indigenous community that's living in the Amazon, uh, and they have set up a little ecotourism project, all as sustainable as possible. You know, it's got solar cells, it's, it's really beautiful, totally managed by themselves. The only big problem, people, the tourists have to fly in. You know, so we, in, in this webinar, we really raised the issue of aviation. And then they said, yes, but you have to realize that if people don't fly in, we have to build a road. And building a road through the forest means that, you know, the illegal loggers, the miners, et cetera, come in. The flying protects us. I just want to say this because I know, you know, I'm very much against aviation, but I know it's a dimension that for some people is really complicated. And I know there's also places here in Paraguay you simply cannot come, you know, if, if it's not this flying. Having that said, it's indeed only... The, the poorest people will just have to, you know, walk two days and then take a boat of three days. I've got indigenous colleagues who had to do that to come to a workshop here. Uh, but, you know, um, I think the whole issue about reduction is also a lot more attractive for people. And that's just a last lesson I want to share from the livestock discussion, because we're very much involved in that. You know, you've got the vegan approach, which I totally admire, and I'm actually vegan myself. But you also have people who say you can just reduce, you know, meat and dairy consumption. And every step is better. And it actually made it so much easier for a lot of people to just switch. Uh, so just keep it in mind, because I think by just saying it's black or white, you fly or don't fly, you know, you also make it a lot harder for people to actually reduce significantly. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good point. Yeah, I think we do need to count, we think about these things in terms of of, of sort of equality and, and that, you know, as, as an individual, it's one thing to say I won't fly, it's another thing to suggest that that should be everyone. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah, I think that the isolated communities are a specific case, aren't they, that they need to be considered. Um, I think Matthias had a clarification question about Bernardina's question on biofuels, and um, was Bernardina talking about combustion of biofuels? Okay. I guess as she doesn't have a microphone, she'll have to respond in the chat. Um, but if she, yeah, if if if, if, that, if the question wasn't quite answered, then by all means, please do follow up, Bernadina. Um, was there? So very very quick. Um, the, yeah. Yeah. Just on the, the the point about solar panels being much more efficient than biofuel is correct. So even on current technology, solar panel you can get about 20% of the solar energy on that surface, whereas biofuel is like 1% of the energy. So it's really inefficient. And I, I, I just, I would, if there's like one takeaway from this, I'd just say biofuel is not a solution. It's not scalable. We already have too much of it. So we definitely need to just remove it from the table, like no ifs, no buts. But then you do get, the, the clever thing the aviation industry is doing is there's a variety, well, it's clever from their kind of, <laughs> in an evil kind of way, right, is that like um, biofuels are relatively cheap, though. Um, they're a bit more expensive than kerosene, fossil fuel, but they're, they're not too much more expensive. The real solution that is scalable, um, but also energy inefficient, is, is using solar or wind and then synthetically pulling carbon from the atmosphere and generating hydrogen and making a synthetic jet fuel. Um, and that takes a lot less land and it is more scalable, though it's still going to be very energy intensive. But that's so expensive. And if they were forced to just use that approach, it would cost them loads. So their trick is they talk about synthetic fuel, but in reality, they use the costs from biofuel when biofuel shouldn't even be on the table. 
Um, and that's a big trick they're playing at the moment that I'd want to draw people's attention to. That's a really, really valuable consideration about what, what they talk about and what they're doing. Um, yeah, we are probably, we're getting towards the end to be honest. I think I might sort of, unless there's any burning questions, I might wrap this up um, and and thank everyone for everyone for coming and uh, particularly thanking all the, the speakers. Thanks to, to Finley, Ali, Almuth, Gary and uh, and Simona for for speaking. Um, it's been we've covered a lot of a lot of ground um, in in sort of just well two hours with some questions. So yeah, thanks to everyone and thanks also to Sally and Todd for for your um, help on the technical side and managing questions. Um, yeah, if I think um, yeah, if, if people have we've we recorded this, we'll, we'll we'll be sharing this on on our website and uh, on our YouTube channels. If you want to come back and and sort of spend a bit more time trying to grapple with some of the information. Um, but uh, yeah, for now, thanks very much. Um, okay. Have a nice day, Hi. evening, morning, Hi. whatever time of day it is with you. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you. you. The final. Yeah, I was going to say, if you're not on the Stay Grounded discussion list and you want to be involved in the Greenwashing Stroke Full Solutions project, can you put your email in the chat? Thank you. Great. Yes, please do. I'm going to stop the recording.